Hello and welcome yeah, to perfect. episode 98. It's a pleasure today to be joined by Greg Bishop. Greg Bishop is a senior writer for Sports Illustrated, the Sports Illustrated, whose feature subjects have ranged from Ricky Williams to Adrian Peterson to Aaron Rodgers. He spent some time as the Jets beat writer for the New York Times and the Seattle Seahawks beat writer for the Seattle Times. Kind of bare bones bio, but we're going to fill in a lot more of the gaps. Greg, how are you today? Thanks for joining me. Oh, I'm doing well. Thank you so much for having me. Man, it's great to have you up there in uh, the Northwest. We were talking a little before we recorded. I got some family up there. So go Seattle, go Kirkland, go, uh, I was going to say go Sonics, but you know, whatever the team becomes in the future. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Hope we get one soon. Okay, sorry, maybe that's a little too soon on that one, right? Too soon. <laughs> Um, so, you know, writing for these great um, publications, Sports Illustrated, New York Times, I know, uh, among others, I'd love to know how you grew up um, as far as, you know, what was your relationship with, with the written word? Were you, were you like so many of us who, you know, waited for, was it Thursday when Sports Illustrated came, like the, the hard copy? You know, were you a sci-fi reader? Like, what was your relationship with, with words and, and reading as you grew up? Yeah, I think you'll like this answer. You know, I grew up in Tacoma, Washington. Uh, my, my parents are both teachers, uh, mostly right. with an emphasis in special education. And so when I was a kid, I was taught that reading was incredibly important from mm -hmm. a very young age. Um, I'm the kind of kid that I would read in the car, even while I was moving. I would mm -hmm. read a few books every week. And I was into everything from you know, sort of faster moving fiction like John Grisham to uh -huh. what I read mostly now, which is longer narrative nonfiction, you know, kind of like um, similar to the work I do. I do remember like <clears throat> every morning before school, my friends would tease me because I would read the Tacoma News Tribune every morning before <laughs> I went to class. And the staff at that time at, at the TNT was incredible. They had John Clayton, who went on to be an ESPN writer. They had this uh -huh. guy. Uh, Mike Kahn, who was a really great NBA writer who passed away quite a while ago, maybe 10 years. And they had a couple of columnists, John McGrath and Bart Wright, who um, were sort of legendary on the Seattle sports writing scene. Mm. And I just remember thinking like that would be a really cool job. Um, you know, the, the written word led me to consider writing as a, you know, vocation. Yeah. And this will sound crazy because I did get Sports Illustrated starting at age eight. I had I have every copy of it from when I was a kid. I mean, this I'm big time nerding out on you here. <laughs> and the two places I told I wrote a paper in ninth grade at Curtis High School mm. where I said I wanted to write for the New York Times and Sports Illustrated. And wow. Obviously, I feel incredibly fortunate and obviously I was incredibly lucky to have been at both those places. Um, let alone one of them. And oh. so, um, yeah, I think it all started with reading. I even build two hours of my day now, um, you know, to read. And whenever kids ask me, I, I do a lot of these similar kind of Zooms. I always, I always tell them that the foundation of any writing or storytelling career is reading and writing, you know, mm. it's repetition. It's, and I could take you through later how I go through all that stuff. But to me, the foundation of everything I do is reading and it's, it's something I have to make time for now. And I didn't sure. when I was younger, but, um, right. you know, I, I make sure I read to my kid every day and uh, try to pass on what my parents pass along to me. Wow. Beautiful thing. Oh man. Um, are you, are you Greg Bishop or are you LeVar Ball? You talked about, you sound like you, you manifested it. You said when you were a kid, <laughs> what did he say? He said, speak it into existence. Yeah, and I, you know, a lot of athletes use the sort of manifestation now. Uh -huh. Dak Prescott is one of them that we talked a lot about it. Uh -huh. uh, you know, I don't think that those sort of terms existed at the time. Right. And, you know, I'm not really sure what made me think I could do it, to be honest with you, mm -hmm. because it's not like I had some sort of step-by-step -step plan. Hmm. Um, you know, I, I basically just tried as much as I could. I wrote for local papers. There was uh, my first job was at the University Place Journal. I was 16, mm -hmm. writing about my classmates. I think I did the student athlete of the week. Uh, I did a couple stories for the Tacoma Reporter. I'm not even sure if it exists anymore. Mm -hmm. And when I went to Syracuse, not only did I not really know the heft of the school, you know, and the journalism program there, the Newhouse School, right. 
but I had never been on a plane before when Ooh. I went to school, which is kind of crazy because uh, I'm like almost 2 million miles on Delta now. But, uh, <laughs> you know, I just uh, sort of figured it out as I went along, got a lot of breaks and, you know, here we are. But yeah, it, I don't know. Um, maybe speaking things into existence really does work. I haven't, I hadn't thought of that until you mentioned it, you know. <laughs> Oh man. Well, I was going to say he supposedly played hoops up at Washington state. Didn't he? He claimed LeVar Ball. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I didn't know. I don't know. Uh, I don't know how much we can trust it, but that uh, definitely a possibility. I think he, I think he, he, that came out when he uh, basically said he could beat Michael Jordan or something like that, you know? Oh yeah. So, you know, he yeah. had to back it up by giving his college stats. Oh. <laughs> and not a, not a big jump from Washington State to the greatest player of all time. Not at all. all. Not at all. Go Cougs. <laughs> Go Cougs. Yeah. Um, so when you talk about reading, you know, two hours every day, um, which is awesome and so like luxurious and like, you know, I'm jealous. But um, is that something where like, I mean, is that strictly pleasure reading or is that like for work or a little bit of both? For me, it's mostly for work, but that speaks a little bit to my process, if you don't mind a quick digression. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, when I talk to classes, I tell them to read whatever they can read consistently. So, you know, to me, it's better to read People Magazine every day than to not read anything at all, mm -hmm. you know. Um, but the way that I come up with story ideas, and I just got off paternity leave, and I just gave my editors about 60 of them. And, you know, to me, it's I'm like... sorry, 60? Six zero? Yeah. yeah Holy, 60, wow. 60 story ideas. and. <laughs> it's a real continuous process for me, you know, uh -huh. basically <clears throat> I think I'm like an all pro consumer. So I write mm -hmm. in, in different forms, which means that I consume in different forms. So for reading, I get every newsletter from every organization that I want to read every morning. Mm -hmm. So that's the Atlantic, that's the New Yorker, that's mm -hmm. New York times, Washington post, Delhi times, um, you know, players tribune, like anything that's sort of in the same realm of the stories mm -hmm. that I'm doing. And then I click on things that interest me and I bookmark them until I have a huge list. I can tell how caught, how busy I am with my actual writing uh, by how long the list is. Some weeks mm -hmm. I'm like two weeks behind stuff. Right. right now I'm almost caught up, which is indicative of I'm just getting started again on some stuff in terms of my job. And then I try to read seven of those a day. So they're generally longer stories. Uh, they're all over the map. They're not all about sports. In addition to that, I skim the times every day, sort of a habit from when I worked there from 20, 20, 2007 to 2014. Yeah. And, um, you know, I also try to read a, a chapter in two books and I sort of mix that up too. So in some ways I want to read sports books because I have written uh, two now, uh, one that'll be out in August, one that's mm -hmm. already out. And, you know, I, I try to watch all those sort of sports segment shows, whether it's E60 uh, 60 Minutes is not sports, usually, but related. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, real sports on HBO. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess like the, I don't really read for pleasure, but it is pleasurable, if that makes right. sense. Right. Like I enjoy reading, but more I am studying and analyzing. I'm looking at uh, who did they get? Why did they uh, structure the story the way they did? What would I have done differently? Who would have been a better get? Um, I discover a lot of stories that are like a line in someone else's story. Cause I, one thing I try really hard to do is not repeat the same tenor of those stories that someone's already mm -hmm. done. That mm -hmm. happens in my business a lot. It happens to me a lot and it's mm -hmm. not frustrating, but I just think we can do better. And so, mm -hmm. you know, while I'm reading, I'm jotting stuff down, you know, um, and I'm looking at, you know, how I might do something. And because I've done that same process for so long, because I build that time into my day, you know, sometimes it's heavy reading. I've gotten big into stoicism lately. My buddy is uh, the foremost author on stoicism in the U.S., Ryan Holiday. Whoa. So he, he sends me a lot of stuff. Um, some of that's heavier, in which case I'd pick a lighter one as my second book. Mm -hmm. You know, you can take you 20 minutes to get through five pages. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes I'm working on, like, this is a good example. I can actually show you the ones I got next to me. So I'm doing a story on this guy who uh, he does the speed bag Bible. He's a drummer who learned uh, to, to teach therapy to people through hitting a speed bag. Whoa. He can play like different uh, songs on there, like everything from Mozart to like heavy metal. And we're going to do a podcast on him, uh, I believe, coming up. So I got his book to read it. Okay. If you want, I can go through the other ones. Yeah, please. So most of them are on my iPad, but these are just this is my pile next to me. Um, 
this is the abolition of man very much in the stoic uh, uh-huh. stoic realm uh this is a book on adhd which i have and only recently figured out uh he may be able to tell by how far i'm going this is a book uh built to lose by a young writer that i've worked pretty closely with named jake fisher yes yes okay that's about the nba draft uh yes and like tanking and why it works yeah. pretty interesting was Oklahoma state having 800 picks uh, uh, I've written a lot about the Shazier family. So when this book came out, we have the uh, same agent as the guy who wrote it. So this is Ryan Shazier's book. Uh, there's a boxing group that sends me all these books because they want me to do a book for them called Hannibal Boxing. This is their latest that they sent me. It's a book on uh, fight fixing and the mob. And then, uh, yeah, that's it. And then the two I have on my iPad. I just, I'm almost done with Malcolm Gladwell's uh, Talking to Strangers, okay. which is a really good book. It's basically like why we can't read people well and why you shouldn't assume that someone's telling the truth. I think it's actually going to be really good for interviewing. Pretty fascinating book. Yeah. Now, is that his newest? I think so. Yeah. Okay. Um, I, I keep a list actually. Here, I'll show you this too. I'm really showing how big of a nerd I am now. We love it. We love it. But I use, I'm old school, so I still use paper. So this is like a list uh... of books I want to read. The crossed okay. out one of the ones I have, and then there's a whole another one on the back. And so wow. these days my wife says the shelves are too full. So I've been switching to the iPad, which really hurt deep in my soul. Yes. And uh, <laughs> I ended up, uh, I only really read those books when people send them to me. And so I'll order six or seven at a time. And then when I finish, I'll get six or seven more. Wow. Wow. So, um, Man, I appreciate that. That's so cool. I mean, you know, people kind of just generically say, oh, yeah, you know, you need to read and read and write to become a better writer and especially read and read a thousand pages for every you know, one you read, write, etc. But like yours is very practical. And I appreciate seeing the process and yeah. having those books next to you is pretty cool. One, one other thing I do that's kind of nerdy is I read to my kid every night. We usually do between four and eight books. He's four, so they're pretty simple. But, mm-hmm. you know, I write TV narration for Showtime. And so I read them in my TV voice to practice. <laughs> so it all ties together. Everything should be moving in the right direction. If yes. I'm doing the job well. Oh, man, that's great. That's so cool. What were some of the books when you were growing up, you know, middle school, high school, that really just, you know, thrilled you that were like, man, as in, you know, kind of like that double feeling of like, I want to do this. And also I could never do this. It's so well done. Yeah. <laughs> You know, I loved sports books when I was a kid. I would devour biographies. I remember the Lombardi one by um, mm. David Moranis, who actually yep. ended up becoming a kind of a friend. Um, so cool. Really blew my mind. Um, I remember where I was when I was reading To Kill a Mockingbird for the mm. first time. And just the pacing and the style of the writing in that book. I remember just thinking like, it's, it's incredible that somebody can make you feel this way through words. Um, I'm trying to think what other books I really loved when I was a kid. Um, I was big into John Grisham. I know that's probably not like a literary answer, but I think that he, he captures your attention in a way that's really good. No doubt. And then there a couple books that I would consider among my favorites I stumbled into around that time. I may be a little off on dates, you know, but I believe I read them in high school. Uh, one was called It Never Rains in Tiger Stadium. It's uh, John Ed Bradley wrote it. He played at uh, LSU. And um, it was really a book about him and his dad, which resonated a lot with me. I'm very close with my dad. He was a high school football coach and teacher who kind of got me to love sports. And, um, you know, I, I feel like that that's a book I like sent him later in life. Um, and then my favorite book probably of all time, I think I read back then, it was called um, The Tender Bar by J.R. Moringer. It's a memoir of his life growing up. Uh, and it's just, a, he's an amazing writer, but you know, uh, you know, books like he wrote Agassiz's biography. Yes, that's why I knew like a game changer. Mm-hmm. You know, I, I think. Um, and then I started getting into like new journalism when I was early into college. So sure. I ended up becoming friends with my mentor, Gay Talis, uh, who wrote no a way. ton of amazing no books. Yeah. Oh my we used gosh. to go to Elaine's every Sunday when I lived in New York and have dinner there. He, he was thinking about making a story I did into a movie. Ah. Uh, I'm Bart Scott, a linebacker who talked a lot of trash. Uh, (laughs) The story in the Times was called The Warrior Raised by Women. And 
Um, I got back from my honeymoon in Australia and I'm jumping right on time here. This was 2009, <laughs> uh -huh. 2008. And uh, I had a letter from him at the times in my mailbox and uh. we ended up becoming friends, but he put me on to like all Norman Mailer, all um, Tom Wolfe, um, uh. Hunter S. Thompson. I've read everything any of those guys have written. And then I try to read things that are relevant to my world. So sure. just American sports writing, all that kind of stuff, you yeah. know? I try to arrange the gamut. And one thing I've been doing lately because I'm old and nerdy is like going back to the classics, you know, so that, mm -hmm. you know, books I maybe didn't understand as well as I could have in high school or that I didn't read all the way through. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, um, I'm trying to think. I read Crime and Punishment recently. It's just fantastic, oh. suspenseful book, you know, um, the kind of thing like you just feel like looking for a little thing. Like, but that book, I said, how can I sustain suspense for a 5,000 word story? Mm which is a lot harder than it sounds and done really poorly quite often. And, <laughs> you know, you're kind of looking at like this book withstood of 70, 100 years, whatever. And I think that those kind of things <clears throat> were really um, helpful for me too. But I've, you know, my mom's a big fiction reader. My dad mm -hmm. reads biographies. So, you know, I did a lot of both of those too. Yeah. I don't know if I have it on this bookshelf here, um, but I have um, a couple of copies of Gate to Lee's of Honor Thy Father. Yeah. Um, that, you know, as my, as an, as Italian, being Italian, um, you know, my grandfather, my, my, one of my heroes in life had this old tattered copy, even when he passed away 18 years ago. And I still have it, you know, um, wow. I remember even going, my, my grandpa lives in San Jose. I remember even going from the address given in the book where Bill Bonanno lived. Yeah. I remember going to see it as like a, like a sightseeing type of thing. Right. Well, well, um, I mean, I'm not trying to curry favor here, but I could definitely get him to sign it for you if you'd like. Oh, man, I would be, I'd be blown away. I um, wish we were downstairs. I have a whole part of my bookshelf that's just all signed books. And oh, he's man. Yeah, it's like my pride and joy. Whenever people write when I make them sign it for me. Well, so tell me about uh, about the DiMaggio piece that Gaitilis did. Oh, it was amazing. You know, I think that there are generally two stories Gay did are considered among the best for like the nonfiction profile writing like the kind of work that I do at a, a much lower uh -huh. level. The first would be Frank Sinatra had a cold, oh, yeah. uh, has a cold, which is generally, I think, considered to be the best profile ever written in journalism. Mm. And I think DiMaggio would be, uh, you know, right up there with it and yes. one of the best sports profiles. I mean, it was just really interesting. Gay had a way that I really noticed, like sometimes he would like, come down to my apartment in the East Village and I would drive him to Jets games because I was covering the Jets at the time. This uh -huh. was 07 to 10 was the, my tenure on the on the beat. And he would um, ride in my terrible little Grand Am that the Times gave us to the game. And my friends would tease me because this was right around when David Halberstam died and he was riding in the car with the young rider who got in an accident. Mm -hmm. And they would be like, don't don't be remembered the rest of your life for the guy who like got in an accident that killed Gates. No. Oh, no yeah but it was just funny to watch him work like he he found stories like he has he carries these little his parents were like tailors and so in his mm. breast pocket of his suit jacket and he dresses up mm. incredible every day no matter yeah. what yeah. and he would pull the little piece of paper out that you would have as like a backing mm. in the tailor thing and he would write notes on them mm. and so i remember one time he found a great story like on isaiah trufant who was like a um fringe roster guy like hanging on for dear life um and he just was talking to him in the corner of the locker room but huh. he ended up giving me stories on mark sanchez we ended up becoming close with bart yeah. uh we yeah. had dinner a few times bart's got me and gay to lease which sounds like some sort of walk into a bar <laughs> joke and he just he had this way of getting in and with the dimaggio uh piece and specifically you could just see that like the depth there of understanding his life. And he didn't always go directly in with the characters. Like I think DiMaggio and Sinatra are two examples of like, he didn't get a ton of time with Sinatra. So no. he learned about the ecosystem that is around him. Right. And it was a good reminder to me that sometimes the best stories aren't the most obvious. And sometimes uh -huh. I do a lot of access kind of work in my job, but right. I would say it's my least favorite part, you know, the, just because it's hard. Man. Well, a couple of things there. Um, the, Again, I don't think it's on this bookshelf. No, it is on this bookshelf. The, uh, I don't know if you can see, the best American sports writing. Yeah. Right, and that big gold. Yeah, one, I see it. Right? That's the century one, right? Yeah. I, I believe that the, the DiMaggio piece is in there. 
I think so. Gay also has an entirely sports collection. If you have oh, yeah, okay. All his sports stuff. He did it with the writer before I met him. And, um, you know, he wrote really well about Floyd Patterson. Mm-hmm. Uh, yes. I'm trying to remember any others. Um, he did, ended up doing Joe Girardi recently. That was a few years really? back. Oh, okay. The Yankees manager. I'm not yeah. sure if that's in the book. But, yeah, I'd be happy to send you a link. It's pretty cool. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's um, there's some obviously it's the best of the century, and there's some incredible pieces in there. There's there's one about the guy I think it was written with maybe the Village Voice. It's written about a guy who I would remember his name Steve something, who was a uh, like like Schwarzenegger type like Mr. Universe, and just the unbelievable like hunger like literal and figurative for like to be the best that I always remember. Um, there's a piece about Tommy Lasorda and his relationship with his son. I mean, there's some, there's, I remember that story. Yeah. Right. I mean, there's some incredible work yeah. there. I'm sure. Yeah. Um, the, so you talk, you know, like the, the Joe DiMaggio piece, right. Which is as in Sinatra, it's so great for many reasons. One is that they, it's about the aging star, right. It's about the star who's, when I say, I mean, who's aged DiMaggio's, you know, he's way past his prime. He's been retired kind of like what now I'm, I'm oversimplifying a bit, but um, you had a great piece recently about, about Manny Pacquiao. Uh, I want to say August of this year. And, you know, it's his last fight. Has he officially retired? He did officially retire. I would say that I think the chance he doesn't fight again, I'd put it at like 20% because that's just boxing. But uh-huh. he's currently running for presidency in the Philippines. And right. What's interesting about that is it's the whole country is like underwater right now. There's some real bad storm and flooding. And oh. yeah, I don't think he's a good chance to win as I wrote in that story. But yeah, yeah he's been an interesting one. I've, I started covering him in 2009. Yeah. Uh, Gay actually used to refer to him as my muse, uh, which uh. I thought was kind of funny. I never <laughs> thought I'd actually hit the muse, let alone <laughs> that Gay would identify one. Right. And it's, it, you know, that's a good example of just how you could cover guys over time as they evolve you know Manny was one of the best stories in sports um, he was climbing divisions and really hurting people he went through a period of real serious turbulence you know um, which I wrote about you remember even writing about his marriage and how he almost wrecked it you know which I noticed when he showed up late to a fight when I got locker room access um, ah. and you know all the way through like he had some terrible comments about um, gay people that I wrote about, um, reconciling that I wrote about, aging I wrote about, why he's still fighting I wrote about. And so, like, to me, a lot of the fun of this is, like, following a guy like Brady or like him or like yeah. Federer when I used to write tennis, you know, yeah. to really just get them from different angles. And it, right. that actually comes, like, the, the watching gay work, you know, mm-hmm. like, Manny Pacquiao and I have never had, like, a great interview. Like, he's just, decent guy i don't have any issues with him um i I mean there's things he said that i absolutely don't agree with at all and but i i feel like everything around him it's almost like an ecosystem you know there are trainers there are doctors there are handlers there's the same faces every fight and there's new faces every fight they they rent this house in la i feel terrible for the neighbors because it's just like 50 people going in and out of it and you know, how people evolve to me is a really interesting thing. I, I yeah. believe that character is action. I hate stories that are 4,000 words that are about why somebody thinks they're good or what they think they're going to do. Like, who cares? Mm. You know, to me, it's uh, it always should be grounded in what people do, because that's always more telling than what they think or mm-hmm. say. And sure. so, um, yeah, like, I, I really like that part of it. But it becomes hard because most of these guys don't come through that kind of length of career unscathed. You know, yeah. some of them like many are self-inflicted wounds, you know, mm-hmm. some of the criticisms of Tom Brady are things that he did and that shouldn't be ignored. So it's like, you have to walk kind of this balance that I think gay walks really well. Like mm-hmm. I, I always say that these guys are my friends. Occasionally they rise to the level of it, but you really do need a separation of church and state there. You know, mm-hmm. they need to understand that, if I'm gonna write this story now and you do something like Manny did by saying comparing gay people to animals, like I can't ignore that story either. And so, right. you know, you, you really can't try to get too friendly or it could end up hurting you just in terms of um, they might feel burned by it. Mm. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, 
Yeah, it's so interesting. The the recent one, like you talk about his chances of coming back. You end the, you end the article with him. I think like like the after fight press conference and basically, yeah, leaving it open as in like I love to fight. And you know, the, you're basically saying there is no reason for him to keep fighting. You know, financially, you know, whatever his legacy. But other than he's a boxer, and he that's what he's always done, right? And he he likes to fight. So very interesting. And yeah, those yeah. are my. Oh. I was yeah. gonna say those are my favorite kinds of stories where you can explain a sport or the world through one person. Yeah, oh, totally. generally it tends to work pretty well. Yeah, totally. Yeah, and, and now that I think about it, you there wasn't there weren't a lot of quotes from him. You know, most of it was kind of off like funny stuff and little jokes. It wasn't truly getting to know him through his speech. But man, we got to know him and his like you said, the ecosystem around him was very, very interesting. Um, but yeah, obviously in boxing, it's a different it's a different story where you know, one more fight, three more fights, five more fights might lead to that brain damage or might lead to that, you know, that knee injury that never heals and that kind of stuff. So really interesting as he keeps going on, huh? How would you describe his, I've talked to some of my students, some of my friends who are, who have family in the Philippines. How would you describe his, uh, his standing in the Philippines? Thank you. <laughs> yeah, there he is. <laughs> How would you describe his his reputation in the Philippines? I mean, is he is he going to win the presidency? Is he just beloved? Uh, I would do two step there. One is I think he would have had a better chance if he had a better performance. I'm not mm -hmm. saying that in a way where I agree with it or I'm espousing That's it. That's right. You made that point in the article. Yeah. Yeah. My understanding is that politically, and this is from talking to some senators that mm -hmm. work out there and are involved in that environment. So these are not my thoughts. They're theirs. But I, you know, it all lines up pretty well mm -hmm. that he's beloved. He's probably the second or first well, most well-known person in the country. Mm -hmm. People stop everything they're doing. Crime plummets to watch him fight. Right. But it's not necessarily like I think for years and I'm guilty of this, people sort of bought him hook, line, sinker as a slam dunk president. And mm. so I was kind of kicking myself when I talked to these senators because I should have done it earlier, because basically what their takeaway is, is that he's thought of as a great guy who's done a lot of great work for the poor, but who is aligned with some scary people and some corrupt people and has been throughout, you know, his um political machinations, you know, whether it was in the Congress or the Senate of the Philippines. And on top of that, um, they see him as sort of an intellectual lightweight, which was the quote used in the story. And, you know, those are kind of tough to do because, you know, like I didn't set out to rip him when I started reporting that piece, but you also have to be fair to the story. And mm -hmm. ultimately my audience has to be at the forefront of my mind rather than sure. how many I feel about anything. And so, I guess there's two parts to the answer. One is I don't think he has a great chance. Um, the kind of people that you're running against when you look at like the Marcos family or the du du Duterte family, mm -hmm. you know, that's like um, Game of Thrones power. You know, mm -hmm. it's the kind of thing where you would do anything not to relinquish it. There are people around Manny now that legitimately fear for his safety. Mm -hmm. uh, they think that, you know, I touched on in the article briefly. He laughed at it when I asked him about it, but I do think that um, if something happened to him, it wouldn't surprise me at all. And mm -hmm. even with all that said, he's tracking a lot better than I thought at the time I wrote the piece. So I would say maybe a better chance than I thought, but still a long shot. Yeah. It would be very typical of his story. And that's what he's selling. The underdog who did things uh, people thought he couldn't do his whole life. Uh, yeah. the, you know, the, the kid who sold cigarettes and you know um loose chain get gas for loose change on the street dad ate his dog i mean like there's a whole long family story there and for him to one become an eight division champion which has never happened in boxing history and mm. to fight for 20 years and to be fighter the decade more than a decade ago and mm. still you know be fighting at a high level like he did against keith thurman in 2019 i mean I would posit there's never been a career like Manny Pacquiao's. Mm -hmm. And I think that um, it's, it's very unlikely it would ever be replicated. And so I guess if he got, if somebody came after him for trying to be president, it wouldn't surprise me if he won another long shot thing, it wouldn't surprise me that much. You know, mm -hmm. I think it would be surprising on a baseline level, but his whole life is more like a movie than my existence <laughs> or anyone I know. <laughs> you know. Yeah. Yeah. There's, um, you know, <clears throat> nowhere that you get old faster than in sports, right? It's, I mean, some sports more than others. I remember when LaDainian Tomlinson turned like 30, it was like he was an old man, you know? Um, but, you know, Manny's continued to go on, like you said, 10, 10, 10 plus years since he was fighter of the decade. 
But you talked about uh, Federer, for example, who's always been a huge, I've always been a huge fan. I'm obviously not the only one. Have you read the, the David Foster Wallace piece on Federer? Oh, yeah. Incredible book. Classic, yeah. right? Yeah. One of my favorites. And yeah, I've even read this stuff about the book. There was a long New Yorker story a couple of years ago, you know, kind of looking at it. And yeah, that was part of the reason that I, I played tennis in high school, not yeah. particularly well. And uh, <laughs> as you can tell by my build, I wasn't built for the uh, sport I cover now, which is mostly the NFL. <laughs> um, but I think that um, I was drawn to him in particular because I just think he was this sort of generational guy that still felt touchable. Like Federer is mm. so regal. Yeah. He's so um, seems kind of like a prince, right? If you were doing like, we'll go frozen here. He's got okay. a little Olaf in him, you know? Right, and like, seriously. Uh, I think that what drew me to him is he also was so relatable, you know, in a way that I don't think many athletes who are that dominant are. Mm -hmm. And I ended up um, doing a piece. I did a bunch of stories on him. Like two of my favorites were, one, I wrote about his footwork, uh, very specifically like mm -hmm. calf down. And I found these uh, ballet schools or academies in Belgium where they used his footwork to teach. Wow. And they would actually show Federer moving to teach dancers who are some of the best movers alive. Yeah. <clears throat> you know, how to essentially move in a way that looked like Roger. Um, mm -hmm. The other one I really liked that was super fun is the premise of the story was that he's the most interviewed athlete in sports history. Because after every single time he plays, he does interviews in three languages television, oh. radio, and print, and it takes about an hour for a regular mm -hmm. match. And so if you add up the number of matches, and yeah. then you give an hour to each one, I mean, the only one I think would be close uh, would be a Muhammad Ali, and he answered every question that anyone ever asked him, uh -huh. much to his credit. <clears throat> the wow. cool thing about the interview piece with Federer is that I ended up um, interviewing him after one of those. So I followed him through the slog and then we got super meta and I did like a 10 minute interview on what it's like to be interviewed for so long. And we were, I remember we were outside in the player's garden at the US Open, which is a great place to do interviews. There's like planes flying overhead, mm. people speaking every kind of language you could imagine. People are eating, stringing rackets. It's just kind of a cool like uh, tennis locker room scene, but yeah. it's outside of New York City. And I remember we were just cracking up the whole time and mm -hmm. planes are going by and, you know, it was, to me, it was, that's a, the kind of guy I want to write about because there's lasting staying power to his story and mm -hmm. to be able to break it off in chunks is sometimes more easier and more interesting than trying to recreate what David Foster Wallace did. <laughs> so what would that be, English? Swiss? What would be the languages you? Yeah, English, Swiss, and French. Swiss wow. German, I think, is what he speaks. There may be a delineation there. Okay. I'm not super, you know. Right. Yeah. Oh man, wow. Um, so you know, so many of. I mean, we talked about the Pacquiao piece. Uh, talk about the Dak, Dak Prescott. And again, I mean, I'm just, I'm kind of cherry picking here. You've had such a, a career. I mean, there, are, you know, you've written what hundreds, thousands of articles yeah oh, easily thousands right. i mean now i only write like 30 40 times a year but at yeah. the times i think of one year i'd like 350 bylines and, yeah you know, so it's impossible to, yeah it's impossible. So probably around three four thousand ish oh, i'm just oh guessing. my gosh but, yeah. oh my gosh um you know there there's some like there's um tell me the name of the miami dolphins uh cornerback oh uh, xavier howard yeah that was right. a fun one. yeah oh, that was a cool one you got to do you know his 10 interceptions and really broke them down so it sounds like you get a good mix of like the X's and O's and, and definitely like, I don't want to, you know, I don't know if it's a generic term, but like, you know, definitely like human interest pieces for sure as well. Right. Yeah. You know, one of, one of my beefs with sports writing in general, and I, I don't begrudge the people that do it. I understand mm -hmm. why they do it, but it's not my favorite is a lot of times when you get above the B writing level, the sports are covered from the top down. So mm -hmm. a lot of sources are owners or general managers or coaches and then stories about players and teams are written from the vantage point of people who run them, which is like fine. That's one approach. But I'm much more interested in the people in the arena. You know, sure. like to me, they're more flawed. To me, they've earned what they've gotten more. You know, most owners just kind of fell into ownership. Like to me, the players are more interesting, but they're harder to get to and they're harder to get to open up, which is why I think fewer people really take that approach. You know, like. If you lined up 20 big stories from the last two months, I would guess that maybe four are about a player with any real kind of depth or access to them. Mm -hmm. And to me, that speaks to sort of the way that everything's set up, you know? And so 
I am looking for human interest stories. I do look at like, like this is one I didn't do last week, but I was thinking about it. Like, how would I write the tornado? You know, so I did research on the towns where they got hit. I found this town in uh, Kentucky. <clears throat> I forget the name of the city. It starts with an M, but they got just crushed from the tornado. And they have this football program that's won 10 times and a basketball team that's always good. I want to say it's Marshall, Kentucky. I can't remember. But so like my idea to my editors was like, maybe we go and we paint like the coach that's been there forever, but never seen anything like this, you know? And ultimately we have another writer in Kentucky. He wanted to do something. And so I ended up not working on it, but you know, I very much am looking for current events. A couple of years ago, I did um, a piece with Michael Rosenberg on um, cops and a uh, cops, athletes who become cops. So you go from like a profession where you're basically in it for yourself and your team to like a yeah. profession where you're trying to protect people, but the landscape for you changes. You go from being entirely honored and loved to being really disrespected in your own community. Hmm. And so when you're looking at the fraught relationships between police officers and the neighborhoods they're in, in many places, I wanted to try to understand that from two people that, from people that had lived in you know different parts of that world and you know to me that's a, the best way for me to sort out the world that i'm living in so i've written a lot about social injustice you know when i couldn't get kaepernick ben baskin another writer and i called every charity he donated the million dollars to and then through the work that they were doing with the money that he gave them we're able to paint i think the best story so far of you know what he was really doing because he wasn't going to say but like his actions against both uh doing in a way that nothing else could right and so you know I, I followed Doug Baldwin for a year while he did social injustice oh, yeah. efforts I followed Eric Kendricks for a year after George Floyd in Minnesota he's a Vikings linebacker and you mentioned Dak Prescott like I mean they wanted me to profile him either way but I always sort of hope that would be a story about mental health and so you know when I look at human interest it's not just the interest in the player or like this guy you know is like I'm kicking around doing Michael Strahan right now. Like he went to space. That's yeah. a huge interest story in terms of he's an interesting human. But I think my lens in part is to look at the world around me. You know, when there was a bus crash in Humboldt, Saskatchewan a couple of years back where 16 hockey players died going to a game in the middle of nowhere. And I went, I wrote about that twice. They sent me the day the crash happened. I wrote a quick, quicker story. And then I went back to write about one of the kids who died. But yeah, that, that I think there's a slight twist on the human interest for me. I'm, I'm also looking to explain the world through sports, which I think is much more possible than people give it credit for. You know, we're always dismissed sort of as the toy department or, you know, when I worked at the Times, it was, you know, 12 tabs down. I mean, you know where you stand, right? But, you know, I'm working on a documentary right now about a person who's not in sports. And they said, have you ever written anything outside of? And, you know, the answer is yes, but also, Sports is everything else. It is sure. the business section. It is the finance section. It is yeah. the feature section. It is weather and money and fame and celebrity and power and yeah. power dynamics. It's all in one place. And that's, I think, what really drew me to it in the first place. Yeah. Well, you know, there's there's good writing, which you've done a lot of. And then there's important writing, which you've done a lot of. And, you know, like the Dak Prescott article is an example of that. Um, about, you know, about the, well, his brother who, who died by suicide, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And in 18 months, Dak's brother died by suicide. He broke his ankle on the field, mm. you know, in a very public way where it like went like this, you know, and, yeah. and um, you know, he, uh, he also had been dealing with a lot of his own anxiety and depression, even before his brother died. The, one of the interesting twists in the story is that his brother's death gave him a purpose he would happily give back. You know, and it was, you know, this idea that he needed to snap out of what was going on. And so, yeah, to me, like the big thing with those is transparency. You know, when I sat down with Dak, we went to a cigar bar in Dallas. We sparked right. a couple of cigars. Sorry to all the kids who are listening. <laughs> yeah. Bad habits don't continue. But you didn't, you, didn't, you didn't inhale, right? No, you don't inhale those. So that's good. <laughs> and, you know, we just spent a lot of time talking about my story, you know, like the, the sort of premise. And I said, here's what I think, you know, I think you wanted to win a Super Bowl regardless. I think it's kind of silly to say that now you want it more. But I do think that there's something to like living through the last 18 months that you've lived through mm. in terms of how it steeled you for something that's incredibly difficult. You're not only a quarterback of an NFL team, 
you're the quarterback of the Dallas Cowboys. You have an owner who's not going to hold back when saying that you're slumping, which we saw a week ago when they're eight and four or whatever. Um, you have a fan base that hasn't won a Super Bowl since the mid-90s, which is insane when you think of the amount of resources that have been pumped into that. Mm -hmm. And then you have your own expectations. Like Dak's not the guy who thought he was a surprise his rookie season. He expected that, you know? And so right. what I said is like, I think that people define you by these three events in your life. And I think or four, if you count his mom dying when he was in college. And yeah. I said, your story to me is how all those things push you to here. And then what's next is undetermined, but also you are different heading into it. And that's how I sort of see it. And he didn't necessarily even agree with the premise, but like he got where I was coming from, which led to much easier conversations. You know, I started the piece with the note he wrote his brother, you know, uh, 15 minutes after he found out that he died. That was, that was, uh, that was upsetting or that was profound. That was profound. Hard to read. Yeah. And it initially I had like the sixth section. I was just like, it's just too strong not to put it there. But I didn't want people to lose necessary. the story. Necessary. Because it yeah. was so powerful. They, you're like walking a tough line there. And, mm -hmm. you know, but that's the, that's the key in the transparency. Like the first day he mentioned the letter. The second day I was with him, I asked him what it said. Uh -huh. Third day I was with him, I was at his house. And you don't meet many athletes like this. There was no, no handler there. You know, right. No, no agent. He, he ordered DoorDash salads for us. I finally paid <laughs> my sports writer bod. And, uh, you know, I said, I just said at one point, like, hey, man, this is a hard thing to ask, you know, just again, being totally transparent and being okay with the no, you know, mm -hmm. I said, but can I see it? And he said, I've, I've literally shown this to no one except my girlfriend. And he went back in the room and got it. And, you know, wow. you just get, you get goosebumps then. That's nothing to do with skill. It's just right. You know, you have to, what I learned over time is that these guys always feel like they're being tricked. You know, like somebody has an agenda, like almost nobody that deals with them doesn't want something. And I want something too. But the difference is I tell them exactly what I want and why it's beneficial. Yeah, I think, I see. Yeah. and I think that that, you know, I got a piece I'm going to start after we're done here on Michaela Schifrin, who I've written a lot about. <clears throat> she's a star skier, probably be the best skier of all time by the time she's done. But she also has lived through a lot. Her father died mm. a year and a half ago. Um, you know, she got injured, career stalled, COVID. You know, she was climbing the records. And that's a sport where you can get hurt every time you put the skis yeah, on. Yeah, for sure. And, you know, it's the same sort of thing. Like we just heard, I talked to her and her mom yesterday morning was while holding my newborn baby. And uh, they both said at the end it felt like therapy <laughs> i don't know that's a good or a bad thing but that's the kind of depth i'm going for it should right. feel a little uncomfortable it should feel like they've gone to where they didn't want to go yeah. if i can get there like with the piece with Dak, like he deserves all of the credit for how deep that story is because most people wouldn't open up that way mm -hmm. and he wasn't scared to in fact he knew why it was important because mm -hmm. him and i care about mental health and because telling these stories in as much detail as possible, I think really shows people that they're not dealing with it by themselves, you know? And so that's been a big emphasis of mine the last couple of years. When you talk about social issues, like, you know, mental health is uh, something that became very important to me when I wrote about Tyler Holinsky, the Washington state quarterback. Yeah. Oh, wow. I, I, I'm sorry. Yeah. I remember reading that piece. I don't, I didn't put the name together at the time. Yeah. And so yeah. like, yeah, I'm very close with the family, uh, you know, and it's just become kind of a secondary mission of if I can write a story that's powerful in light of that, then I absolutely will. Yeah. Did Did you feel like Dak Dak felt that it was like a cathartic experience for him, or is that or is that know, too simplified? He didn't say that, but it felt that way, you know, and like. I can usually kind of tell how it went by whether we stay in touch. You know, some guys I never talk to again. Dak and I are pretty regular contact. And not only that, this is kind of weird, right? Because I just told you a while ago that you're not friends with these people that you're writing about. And in general, that's true. And I, I wouldn't consider him a friend by any stretch. I'm not on speed dial with him or anything. But mm -hmm. we have, like, flipped a couple books back and forth, you know? And he, nice. I got him to reading uh, Ryan Holiday's last book. I told you he's my stoicism author friend. It's called... Yeah. Courage is Calling. We both watched, listened. To, he listened to it. I read it. Nice. We talked about it after. Huh. A book I really like in terms of the writing process is called The Inner Game of Tennis. Pete Carroll recommended it. Oh, to yeah. Me. Oh, yeah. And I, I sent it to Dak. I mean, and so I, I would imagine it was at least in some way cathartic because he continued working on it, you know. And to mm -hmm. me, 
to me, stoicism is a great philosophy for people that take um, creative pursuits because mm -hmm. it's thought of as like this passive ancient thing. It's not, it's really like, it really speaks to focus, you know, like how to control what you can and how to let the rest of it go and how to view the world in a way, like one of the baseline tenets is memento mori. It means we're going to die. And it, you know, essentially it's like death is not, I have the, I have five principles taped right here behind my thing. If you, you know, one, we suffer more in imagination than in reality Two, associate only with people who prove you three, the greatest remedy for anger is delay Four, value your time more than your possessions. Five, death is not in the distant future. We are dying every day. And to me, if you use those five as a baseline for how you move through life, it's a pretty good starting point. Wow. Number one, right off the bat, hit me hard. Read, uh, sorry, read number two again. Uh, associate only with people who improve you. Oh, improve you. Yeah. I, think, I thought originally it was approve of you and that's a whole different thing. Yeah, no. <laughs> so it's like, you know, like don't get wrapped up in how, how much something hurts in your own brain. Then it's like be around people that make you better. Then it's like, don't send that email when you want to, when you're mad. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like spend time with your kids. And then like the ultimate kicker to me is like every day we move closer to death. That's just everybody. And if you think of it that way, you don't need some sort of drastic event in your life to live every day as best you can. And, you know, it's a sort of a simple mindset flip, but for me, it made a world of difference. Yeah. That wow. Dak and I now are amateur poor man's philosophers. So <laughs> here we are. <laughs> well, in the same way as I, I was, all, I was already a big fan of Giannis. And then I read Mir and Fader's book and I'm like the hugest fan ever of Giannis. And uh, just read that. Yeah, oh, you got, I'll oh, give it a read. It's, I mean, you think you know his story maybe, and, but man, you have no idea. Incredible. He's an amazing, amazing writer. We have the yes. same book. Yeah. So I'm glad the book did well because it's better for all of us. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Yeah. Her time was incredible. They, they're talking yeah. about the Mirren Fader uh, was the opposite of the curse, you know, the, the blessing. I forget the term they've given it, but she wrote an article about this Lakers, um, you know, six man, eighth man named Austin Reeves. And he had a game winner the other night. And um, there's been a couple that have like found immediate success. And, you know, Giannis, they won the title and all that. <laughs> We had the opposite effect. We had the SI Jinx. Uh, yeah, exactly, right? The best example of that is my weirdest cover I've ever had was on Jonas Gray. He was a running back who scored four touchdowns against the Colts, and I was sitting at home, and I had oh. just been at the Patriots locker room, and I interviewed one guy in every corner and asked for their best Brady story, and yeah. he gave a great one about how his mom asked for an autograph, and he was, like, getting ready to sign something for her, and she's like, no, I want Tom Brady's autograph. Yeah. And, uh, <laughs> So I ended up writing that up just because they beat the Colts so bad this day. He's on the yeah. cover, uh, comes out Tuesday, and he slept through the meeting on Wednesday and got released the next day. Oh, no. So we, we tend to jinx people. Maybe they should pick Mirren over me. Oh, man. Man, um, I know that you've moved through and you, you've got, you know, got to wrote, written for the New York Times. Um, you know, Sports Illustrated is, is hallowed ground, as you've talked about, as you know better than I do. Um, what is it like in 2021 running for Sports Illustrated? Is, I don't know if SI in particular or just the whole landscape, but, you know, obviously I'm not saying anything new. Print, print is dying or, or not, as, not the same as it was. But, um, you know, there's also more, I, I think, emphasis on like entertainment and, you know, multi, multimedia. You know, you get, do the podcast, you do the video, you do this, you do that. What is it like in, in the end, though, just to write for such a hallowed institution? Yeah, you know, I think at this point it feels a little conflicted. Um, the dream I remember most often that I have is like this huge wave right in the back of my head and it hasn't quite crashed into me. I think mm. in some ways journalism in 2021 feels that way, you know. Um, I don't think there are many places where you can wake up and feel like you're certain to exist you know, in a year. And I think that that's uh, sort of stressful. So I would just say that sort of as a baseline. But I do think there are other parts of it that I tried to really focus on, you know. Um, for one, I have the kind of job that doesn't, there aren't a lot of them anymore. I write longer stories. I can mostly pick what I want to do. Um, we have not been impacted a ton in terms of travel budget or you know, obviously we've lost a lot of staffers. We've had six rounds of layoffs in the seven years I've been there. Hmm. Um, the job remains mostly the same, which I think is something I'm quite grateful for, especially knowing the landscape. 
You've seen other places like ESPN shutter their print magazine. You have to think that'll happen to us eventually if you're being realistic. But, you know, I think this sort of pivot is um, I work with incredible writers. I work with incredible editors. I'm working at a place I dreamt of working growing up. Yeah. And you know, it's just good to remember that, you know, things change. Like it's mm -hmm. not it's not like some of this wasn't inevitable. It's not like newspapers and magazines haven't shot themselves in the foot. And I don't mean any place specifically, but, you know, we, sure. we all know how it worked, you know, like the it was slow to embrace the web. Uh, digital advertising goes to Facebook. I mean, yada, yada, yada. And then there's all these scandals that hurt credibility. Then there's the right and all the criticism. I've definitely had people turn down story requests before just based on working for the New York Times uh, mm -hmm. and their politics or religion compared to that. But I do think like, you know, I, I still feel incredible lucky. My friends always tell me I can't complain about my job. I've covered every tennis grand slam, bunch of Olympics, uh, oh, Tour de France. I mean, I've been all over the world with my job and now I'm home raising a couple young uh, troublemakers. And <laughs> I mean, it, it's, um, it's more good than bad for sure. As long as you're cognizant of what's happening. And I think what plays into that for me is something you mentioned at the end of your question, which is the way we tell stories is changing constantly and rapidly. Uh -huh. I, I would always like to tell students that the, about the time there's a writer I worked with when I interned at the Syracuse Post Standard. This was in 1999. Good Lord, that was a long time ago. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he basically said this internet thing is sort of a fad, you know, yeah. at that point, there was like one computer with internet for the whole department. I mean, that's, it's just crazy to think about yeah. that now. You have a, I got a computer on my wrist, you know, and right. like, uh, um you know like I, I just never want to be that guy so you know i got some podcast stuff in the works i've got a, a couple of documentaries i'm working on outside of si i've done a lot of stuff with si tv whether being on camera or in the background as a producer mm -hmm. I, and basically i i think i see my job now more as a storytelling job than a writing you know i yeah. think i'm best at writing long um Writing TV is really hard. You got to tell a whole story in nine lines and each line mm -hmm. is only as much as you can say before you breathe. It's not even a full sentence. Yeah. And so, you know, I, I think now I look at it more like I have this idea, where does it fit best? Is this a mm -hmm. podcast? Is this a, you know, a, a topic for a radio show? If I have to guest on something, is it, um, is it, would this work as a book? Then you call your agent, does this work for you? You know, I'm, I'm considering one now, we just talked yesterday. And so I think it's, it's, you have to sort of embrace the changes, you know, you have to know this isn't the 1980s. They're not going to be wheeling a drink cart by at 4 PM with anything you could want. There won't be big boondoggles to swimsuit, uh, you know, events where they fly in all the riders and everybody hangs out on the beach for 10 days. Like mm. to lament the fact that I was born 20 years too late yeah. would be to waste energy on that kind of stuff, you know? The fact is we still exist. The fact is we still do good work under mm -hmm. more extreme conditions. And the fact is I, I wouldn't trade my job for many others. And so yeah. to me, that speaks to everything we've been talking about. It's all, it's tricky and it can be frustrating and stressful, but it's, it's still pretty fun at the end of the day. I, I don't have a lot to complain about, but I complain about a lot. <laughs> that would be my tag. Yeah. Greg Bishop said it and Run DMC said it, right? It's tricky. <laughs> and man, you, can't, you can't be long form, right? I mean, I, as a reader, I say that you just, you just can't beat it. Is there, a, you know, you, you talk about that's so cool, you know, how adaptable you are. And obviously you have the skills to do so many different things and have done. Is there any type of writing, like not, not I guess, either genre or like length, et cetera, that you've just said like, hey, I, this doesn't work for me. I don't want to do it. I'm not good at it or, or, or just, you know, this doesn't work for me. Uh, anything that's more academic, you know, mm -hmm. I, mean, I did fine in my classes writing that way, but it just feels like math in a way, which yeah. isn't necessarily bad. Like I view writing like architecture, you know, there are bricks and they need to go in the right place for everything else, the detail to fill in and look mm -hmm. right, you know? Mm -hmm. So I, I guess I'm more mathematically inclined and I, I did study finance in college too, just because I wasn't sure I wanted to do this necessarily. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so I, I think there is something to that, but it just feels a little dry to me. Yeah. Uh, the other thing that I spectacularly failed at, but it might, we might try it again, is I've become kind of close with Dak's uncle, which I became close with him before I knew Dak at all. Mm -hmm. And we, we uh, I did a project in 2016 called Football in America with Michael McKnight. This was before the election. Ah. 
they sent us to, I, I want to say 23 states and he did the coast and I did the Midwest and the South. Hmm. And we ended up writing a 30,000 word story on like sort of where the country was at that point through the lens of football. So wow. I met with Jerry Jones one day, the next day I'm at a college in Texas that turned its football field into a garden, realizing that there was a food desert around them and that sucking at football and the resources that it took wasn't worth the, the, the trouble. The next day I'm meeting with James Andrews, who's fixed so many players and tells me that if uh, they created a game called football today with the same rules, nobody would allow it to be played because it's so strange as a pursuit in general. You know, Mike ended up interviewing strippers in like a Tampa strip club because there's an economy to Sunday that works different. And uh, we probably had like a hundred of these vignettes that were strung together. Yeah. It ended up running three of the five parts in the magazine. Um, which was the longest football story I think we ever published, you know, mm. 20 pages in the mag. And um, it ended up the last, it's actually kind of interesting, the last, the very, very last day, I get a call from the NFL and they say, Goodell will talk to you. This is Monday. I'm sitting in the stands at Monday Night Football. No, no, I'm in the stands at Monday Night Football. My buddy's in town watching the Bills. And he says he bet $10,000 on Hillary Clinton to win the election. Oh, man. And I said, I was just in the South and the Midwest, and I didn't see one sign for her. Like, I don't think uh... it's free money. I think it is. I think Trump has a real chance. Next day, I wake up. NFL says Goodell talked to him Wednesday. So I book a red eye to Newark Tuesday night, night of the election. And by the time I land, Trump has won, you know, and it was just. It was just like really trying to explain sort of the, the way that projects like that work, you know, like uh -huh. uh, to explain the world through the lens of what's going on in football. Oh, I, th cool. I thought about revisiting it in 2020, but just didn't have time. Uh -huh. Well, no, I mean, you, you call that a, a failure, though? That's the one with Dak's uncle or is that a different one? Oh, yeah. So, oh, shoot, I lost my whole train of thought there. So I met Dak for that story, Dak's uncle. We went to breakfast and we talked about what it's like to watch your, your nephew. Oh, my gosh, I forgot the takeaway. <laughs> okay, that's bad. Right, I, I left you hanging there. Uh, it's all right, it's all right. So Philly Barb is Dak's uncle. He's a teacher, but he's also in Orange, Texas. He's also a musician. Okay. And um, we ended up hitting it off at this lunch. He actually predicted that my, my wife and I would have a boy uh, um, as our first child and that we would get pregnant soon. And we were in like two months. He was the first one to predict it. He actually accidentally broke it on Facebook when I told him the story. <laughs> And last year, before Dak's brother died by suicide, Phil asked me to write a song with him. Whoa. And we tried really hard, and I was so bad at it. I love music. I'm playing music all day long, and I just, that's maybe a form I should stay away from. But we're talking about trying it again, you know? What, oh, man. What, what genre or genres? He's uh, mostly country, but or like country rock, you know? Okay. And he like knows all these instruments and um he has a band i'm free of the name of it but if you look at phil e barb e b a r b he uh he would you could you could check his stuff out and we were writing about like how your life changes and how you grapple with it which was indicative of dak him me like anybody who's sort of yeah. in a creative process and trying to climb whatever there is to climb you know yeah. and everything i sent him he was just like this sucks <laughs> But you never know. Maybe we'll do one about mental health now. You know, you you I, can, I can guess on it. You haven't made it big in the music world yet. No, no, no you got my way. You know, yeah. when I, I got an Emmy, but none, none of the other ones. <laughs> oh. I thought maybe the last thing I, would, I wanted to ask you about is, uh, well, I want to ask you about a lot of things, but, but in respecting your time, because we could be here for hours, um, is the state of NFL, um, you know, you, you wrote about, you know, 2011, 2013, you wrote about, you wrote about Aaron Hernandez and Urban Meyer, who obviously was in the news recently, and you know the Patriot way. And you know Aaron Hernandez was obviously a star for the Patriots, and then it was like, well, see you later. I, you know, I, I just think of his story, and it was like, you know, who knows how much of that was from CTE? I mean, he had, I mean, his life was, you know, just amazing. You couldn't make that stuff up. All the things that happened, obviously, in, in a negative way. I guess what I'm getting at, though, is especially with the with regards to concussion. It, I felt like a couple years ago, and I couldn't name the exact year, that there really did seem to be like a sea change. But it seems like the NFL is just as popular as ever. And, you know, maybe some of the high school numbers are down, you know, all kinds of different reasons. Long question, but I mean, how do you see, if, if you're looking at it strictly in a 
like publicity, media, marketing way, has the NFL weathered that storm? I mean, there was, you know, the news that came out recently about the, you know, South Carolina, the player, you know, at uh, Phil Adams, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and gosh, um, uh, the one, uh, Vincent Jackson, you know, recently. I wonder how big that is in the pe- with the people you talk to. Is that still at the forefront? There was that horrible, the Chargers uh, player the other day who, you know, got knocked out and, you know, his arms yeah. were frozen, the whole deal. So, sorry, it's a long, long heck of a question, but just kind of what the state of the NFL is with the concussions and such. Yeah, I mean, to answer your question first, I would say they have weathered the storm. Um, numbers are up everywhere. TV viewership's up. Merchandise is up. Post-COVID, fans are back in stadiums. Um, whether from a marketing and narrative and existence standpoint, they've gotten through that. I, I think the answer is absolutely yes. Hmm. But I, I personally am very conflicted about all of it. And I've written about this conflict uh, with football and with boxing. Um, in some ways, I think we're partly responsible for glorifying something that at a baseline level is just not okay. And I love both sports, but it, it's really hard to watch all this stuff that happens. You know, um, there was a really bad fight injury the other day. Chris Algieri got knocked out by uh, Connor Ben. And, it, you know, you just like people love big knockouts, but it's got to stop right before like the guy's lying flat on his back and needs mm. to be carried out on the stretcher. I mean, I've been right. at fights where people died. I've been at games where people got severely hurt. I've known players. When I was writing for the Times, I went went to surgery with Chris Jenkins once, this mammoth defensive tackle that played for Carolina and the Jets, if you remember from like 2000 to 2010-ish. And, you know, he was one of the best players in the league when he played. But I remember sitting with his wife in the room when he's in the gown and about to go back. And he looked at me and he said, sometimes I wonder why I do this, you know? And it was like, I just, I'll never forget his face in that moment, like the way that it looked, you know, he looked scared. And this is a guy who's 370 pounds, you know, like could, could hurt anyone alive. And, you know, I, I've long said that I think at some point football will go more like boxing. It'll be more of an inch for it. It will be tied more to socioeconomics. I'm not saying that that's right. It's just sort of how it is, mm. you know, where you see boxing at its most popular are these pockets where people need to fight to escape circumstances. And, mm. I think there's something borderline, there's something there that makes me just uncomfortable at, at the start of it. And, you know, there's a bloodlust to those sports that is part of what makes them attractive, a violence that's inherent and visceral mm-hmm. and obvious. And I think the NFL's tried really hard to like, uh, you know, make concussions more of a priority, to have players report stuff, to do baseline testing, but they are walking an impossible line that will never yeah. solve the problem yeah. because right. If you take too much of the violence out, your sport isn't what it was. It's not as appealing. It's not as profitable. And they are ultimately a business. So I understand their conflict. But I also don't buy. I did a piece a couple of years ago, a couple of examples. Uh, one, one year, I just checked in with four players every Monday to write about what they were doing to get better. This was mm-hmm. Justin Forsett, Ryan Harris, Alan Robinson, and Cameron Jordan. Mm-hmm. And it was crazy, the, the stuff they went through. It was the things they had to do on Monday to feel normal again, the, the days they couldn't get out of bed. And what was really interesting is all of their performances, including for second and cut and Jordan becoming a pro bowler were tied to how healthy they felt. Mm. So as, as soon as they were recovering from stuff, they'd play better, they'd get signed. I mean, it's essentially the NFL is a yearly war of attrition. You know, yeah. that's what it's about like. And, you know, I also wrote, um, recently about um you know cte with tyler holinsky and you know i just um i did one week where i wrote about um every injury in the league we highlighted a couple it was like week four of 2016 or 17 Mm. and they just called it pain and they put guys all over the cover you know i'm the last person that interviewed ryan shazier before he got paralyzed two days before it happened we had breakfast and watched film and talked about boxing and you know, it's just, it's hard to, for me personally, that I'm only speaking for myself. It's hard for me personally to continue to just put it out of my mind, to compartmentalize it and pretend like there's not just something at, at its core that's wrong with these pursuits. Now, I also believe in freedom of choice, but you want to talk about like how, how it's percolating. Like, yeah, absolutely. It's on the minds of players. And I can't tell you how many, at least 20 have told me never to let my kid play football. Mm. And Michael Bennett's been like the strongest one about it. He's a very interesting guy who retired probably a year or two before he could have um, mm. been playing. And, 
you know, it's just like your kid doesn't need to play football. So don't, you know, don't allow him to pursue that. And so yeah. I, I don't believe I will let my kids play if they, if there was a really strong argument about it, we'll see. But the thing to me that could potentially impact this in the way that you were laying out, you know, um, will football end or become a niche sport? To me, it's when there's 3000 examples of the CT stuff where now there's like 40, mm. 40 is a lot. So don't get me sure. wrong. That, sure. that is an alarming number. And my friend, Ken Belson just wrote the piece on Vincent Jackson. It was fantastic and powerful in a way that broke your heart, mm -hmm. but we're just seeing these guys the physics of what they do, speed, you know, acceleration and force. It's like, you know, N Newton or whatever. Uh, and like it, I just feel like eventually there's going to be a sea change based on like when it's not, when it's impossible to ignore, mm. when there are thousands of Vincent Jacksons, how can you keep putting kids in pads? I just sure. don't think you can. I, I think at minimum flag football before ninth grade. And I think if you can avoid it, I don't see any reason why you can play they, People always point to teamwork and leadership and you can get those from, you know, basketball or chess or mm -hmm. any other sort of endeavor. And so mm -hmm. I love combat sports as much as probably any person, but I feel very uneasy about it as a whole. Yeah. So you just got a full true confession there. <laughs> I, I, I appreciate that. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, there's no, no moral high ground here. I, I mean, I, I followed football for many, many years, was a big fan, never my favorite sport, but I was always a fan for me. It was junior sale. Yeah, I was there. I happened to be in San Diego the day that that happened, and I was interviewing Connor Fields. This actually show you how fucked up sports. Oh, sorry, I just should sorry. 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 show you how messed up sports are. <laughs> I was interviewing Connor Fields, who's a BMX rider, mm. at the Chula Vista training facility when my phone buzzed like six times in a row. And the New York Times used to have the number that called you from any phone was all ones, so we would mm. call it the devil ones. Ah, uh, yeah, right. I finally picked up in the middle of the interview. And I said, "Who who died? Like, what's going on? Like, why do you keep calling?" And they're like, junior say, I'll leave now. And so I like had to leave the interview, go to the house. You remember the mom sobbing? I was mm. what, 10 feet away. And then this year I'm in China covering and Connor Fields is still a BMX rider and he has this terrible crash and almost gets paralyzed from that sport. Oh my God. And it's like, you just, I'd never put it together in a way like you just said it, you know, like you led me to the place where I thought of it that way. And like, yeah, I mean, when you think about it, these are dangerous pursuits, you know, and to your point on say out um i'll never forget his mom and being there i remember actually walking over to the beach is right on the beach you know like road house is that, ocean, is that ocean side yeah and i remember after she finished i walked over to like where the concrete was on the beach and i threw up because mm -hmm. it, i just felt sick to my stomach you know and so i think there are humans that do this kind of job and it's not as simple as just like show up and glorify as sure. people might make it out to be this I have a lot of conflicting feelings about it. Well, yeah, I mean, there's a guy, you know, he grew up, he grew up in a rough neighborhood. He made it out. He played for the local team. He was, you know, just a great guy. Obviously on the field, he was a, you know, he was a nail as he had to be to be good in football. But, you know, off the field, he did all the charity work. Just a great, great guy. My dad got to play in a golf tournament, maybe even two with him, you know, one of those charity ones. And just an incredible story. And it was just like, if Junior Seau, if it hits him, then like, who's who's safe from this, you know? Yeah. That yeah. Was and when, how early do you get it? And all those kind of things. Like you just, they could all have gotten CT from high school. We just don't know. what. Oh, you know? Exactly. On a much lighter note, what, uh, what are you working on in the future? If you don't mind sharing, you don't have to. Maybe you yeah, no, I, um, I got this Michaela Schiffer piece to be one of our four winter Olympic preview covers. Always good to steal one of those. This is a shorter story of the shortest of the four. So I'll get one for like 1500 words, which is nice. Um, and then I started a bunch of NFL stuff. So I'm trying to write the Cardinals, the Rams, Cooper cup, um, just kind of getting rolling. It's a tough time of year to get stuff set up, but I just got off paternity leave and then I'll, I'll be doing our Super Bowl cover again. So I'm out of wall space. We've got to find somewhere Very else cool. for them. But my ultimate goal is this. I just have revealed throughout this podcast how big of a nerd I am. Um, mm -hmm. Mike Silver had 13 of them when he was at SI. So my goal is to catch him if I can. This will be my eighth this year. <laughs> we'll, we'll see if we publish long enough. Give us a, give us a good look at the covers if we, if we can. Yeah, so the first one was uh, Patriots over Seahawks, then Broncos, Patriots again, Eagles, Patriots again, Chiefs, and then Bucks. 
And you'll see my father in life there. That's like, uh, you know, one of those kids chairs I just put together this morning. <laughs> <laughs> the Patriots Seahawks was at the, uh, when, when Marshawn Lynch got stopped at the goal line. Yeah, that was my first one. And I actually had been talking with Russell Wilson's agent like the day before about doing a book and uh, uh, when he threw the pick, it kind of evaporated. Oh, man. Oh, man. Well, so tell us what, where we, you know, we can find you on uh, online, obviously through SI. Yeah, SI.com. SI.com is good. We all have author pages, uh, co-author of Talking to Goats. Uh, that's available at HarperCollins or Amazon or any of that stuff. And then uh, I write for Showtime's All Access, which is... Um, not subscription necessary you can find them okay. on youtube if we don't put them up for free and yeah. we've done ones recently if, uh, don't judge me uh, we did a few digital ones for the jake paul woodley rematch that's tonight <laughs> don't judge me. um we did a best of boxing show that'll be out next week for 2021 really good year for the sport in terms of fights and uh before that tank davis and uh and we didn't do Wilder Fear this time, yeah. And so there's an all-access page at Showtime. And then I got a couple of dogs, but they won't be out for a while. So maybe next time I come on. <laughs> yeah, that's so yeah. cool. Um, shout out to Jim Gray. I saw him. Uh, he walked right past me when I was in uh, Santa Monica a few years back. Actually, it's been probably he lives better, years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, he lives very close to there, uh, up on the hill. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, you got to write about the amazing Tom Brady, right? Absolutely, yeah. And, you know, we just had Brady as our sports person, which – broke my heart because I've always oh. wanted to put this in cover, but I was on leave, so I couldn't do it. And oh, so yeah. we'll see if they make it back. But, you know, I've done, as you can see, seven of these, uh, Brady was in five of the games, which is pretty amazing. So I don't know what else there is to say about him, but if he's <laughs> back in it, we'll have to find a way. Oh, my gosh. What, uh, do you have any, any favorite independent bookstores or local bookstores who get the Goats book? Uh... You know, I haven't seen here in Seattle. I mean, in New York, we always used to go to Strand. You know, that was my go-to spot in the okay. East Village. It was fantastic. I guess it's south of Union Square. Okay. Um, love that place. Powell's in Port Portland. Um, yeah, any any local place would be awesome over, uh, you know, the bigger chains. Yeah, there you go. Oh, man. Well, had a great time talking to you. Um, love to talk to you again, you know, down, down the road. Uh, keep up the great work. Thanks for all the, the human interest stories. And... Uh, you know, you're prolific, but also like definitely quality and quantity. So appreciate getting into your, into your labs. It's so cool to see all the, the sayings you got there and all what you're working on. You know, I got to package this in some way to share it with my, my students about like a really uh, focused way of reading and how important reading is. And that's so cool that you read to your kids every day. That's another reminder to me to keep doing that to mine. It's been a pleasure and I wish you great luck in the future. Thank you for having me and allowing me the platform to reveal just how large of a nerd I actually am, you know? Yeah. I tell my students nerds run the world and that's a great thing. Right? <laughs> nerd, I use nerd as a compliment. Yeah, me too. Me right? too. I, uh, yeah. There's nothing I would change about any of this, you know? So that's you're, the good part. You're close to, uh, to that guy. Uh, what's his name? William Bill Gates. I think he's kind of a nerdy guy. He's done all right. <laughs> yeah. He lives the next suburb over a bit bigger of a house. You right. Know, but. You know, that guy that's uh, putting all those 5G chips or whatever into our vaccines, that guy. Yeah, we're about 20 minutes and 2 million miles from Bill Gates, Paul yeah. Allen, Jeff Bezos. Yeah. Oh, exactly. Late Paul Allen. Yeah. Thanks so much, Greg. I really appreciate your time. Thank you for having me. Thank you for listening to episode 98 with Greg Bishop. You can now subscribe to the Chills of Well podcast on Apple Podcasts and leave a five star review. You can also ask for my name using Alexa and find it on Stitcher, Spotify, Amazon Music, and all those good ones. Follow me on Instagram where I'm at Chills at Will Podcast or on Twitter while you're checking out Greg Bishop on Twitter. I'm at Chills at Will P01. You can watch this and other episodes on YouTube. Please subscribe to the YouTube channel and the podcast while you're checking out this episode. This is a passion project of mine, a DIY operation. And I'd love for your help in promoting what I'm convinced is a unique and spirited look at an often ignored art form. The intro song for the Chills of Will podcast is Wind Down Instrumental. And the other song played on the episode is Hoops Instrumental by Matt Whitehour. Both songs are used through archesaudio.com. Please tune in for the next episode, a conversation with Sara Borjas. She's a Chicanx pocha from the Americas before it was stolen and its people were colonized. She's a Fresno poet. Her debut collection of poetry, Heart Like a Window, Mouth Like a Cliff, 
was published by Noemi Press in 2019 and won a 2020 American Book Award. She teaches innovative undergraduates at UC Riverside, believes that all Black lives matter and will resist white supremacy until Black liberation is realized. And she lives in LA while she stays rooted in Fresno. The episode with Sada Borjas will air on January 11th. For now, thanks again for listening. I hope that these quarantine days bring you texts by writers with mad skills like Greg Bishop, whose work gives you chills at will.